I had an abortion, or maybe I didn't. Why does it matter? Abortion shame is very zeitgeist at the moment, or more precisely and far more happily, anti-shame is very zeitgeist. In the New York Times, in a number of online magazines, and on websites like One in Three, 45 Million Voices, and Exhale, women are speaking out. They are resisting the shame by breaking their silence about their abortions. But the success of this fledgling speak out movement is far from guaranteed. Indeed, if we want it to succeed, we are going to have to help. But before I can tell you what it is that you can do to stand up for women, I really need to take you on a bit of a 360 around shame. I need to talk to you about what it is, how it works, and what it does to its victims. So I thought what I would ask you to do is just actually stop looking at me for a minute and have a look around you. So look at your neighbors, smile at them, wear a Ted, it's cool. And now focus a bit on the women. So just meet the eyes of the women and smile while I tell you that one in three of those women will have an abortion in her lifetime. Now that would be true if this was an Australian audience or a British audience or an American audience. One in three women will have an abortion in their lifetime. And if you haven't yet, you can stop looking at each other now. <laughs> now, there are a lot of ways that I could have made that point. I could have thrown something like this up on the screen. And I could have said, one in three Australian, American, and British women will have an abortion in their lifetime. I could have said, according to the World Health Organization, abortion, medical or surgical, is one of the safest and most common medical procedures. But it's not the same, is it? What if I had said, OK, have a look around at everybody in the audience, focus in on the women while I tell you that every single one of those women in the next five years is going to blow her nose? Not the same. That is shame. We actually aren't born feeling ashamed of anything. We're not ashamed of our nakedness, we're not ashamed of our bodily functions, or our sexual desires, or reproduction, or abortion. We learn from our communities what is shameful, and it is the real or perceived oversight of those communities that make us feel shame. Now, shame is about fear, but what are we afraid of? This is Brene Brown. She gave a fantastic TED talk, which I really commend to you, about shame. And when I saw it, I went scurrying off to find her academic work. And what I discovered was that according to Brown, what shame is, is the acutely anxiety-inducing experience that we are flawed and that others are going to find out. That we are flawed in comparison to other people and other people are going to find that out. And when they do, they're going to demean us or ridicule us or judge us and cast us out. So I've used that word cast out for a reason. And the reason is that I'm trying to underscore the fact that the consequences that people fear, the fear that shame, that evokes in people, the consequences they fear of being shamed are very, very real. They're very, very significant. So in ancient times, if a woman brought shame on her name or her family or her community, she could literally be thrown out of that community, cast out. She could be stoned. In some places in the world today, that is still the case. In our world, a woman might be afraid, if people find out that she's had an abortion, that her church community will evict her. Or she might be worried that her family or her boyfriend or her husband might throw her out of the house, or that her friends will start a whisper campaign about her. But the thing is that those fears all cut to something very, very essential about us, very, very primal. And indeed, that is why shame is such an ancient form of social control 
because it actually goes to something that may be hardwired in us, which is this desire to stay in connection with other human beings. Shame evokes the fear of disconnection. I had an abortion, or maybe I didn't. Why do you care? That's the shame cycle. Shame equals silence equals ignorance. But before I can tell you and will tell you about that silence and that ignorance and how it hurts women, I want to tell you one thing that shame doesn't do. Shame does not stop women having abortions. Now, the data on this is not great, and I'm a researcher, so I care about this kind of stuff, and it's not great because it's difficult data to get and because abortion is stigmatized, and so the research funding isn't there. But from what we can tell, shame does not stop many, if any, women from having abortions. But that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt women. It does, and it hurts them by silencing them and by causing ignorance. So let's talk about that. Silent women can't ask for support. Two-thirds of women fear that if others find out about their abortion, they will look down on them. And so, nearly that number, 58 to 60 percent, don't tell their friends and their family about their abortion and talk about their abortion little or not at all. Silent women can't share information. So if I reach out to someone and say, oh my God, I've got, I'm pregnant when I don't want to be, I don't know what to do, and someone says to me, oh, you know, that's terrible, like that happened to me too, and here's how I felt, and here's how it went, and I went to this clinic and it was terrific, or I went to that one and it wasn't so good, but whatever you do, if you go to this one, be really careful, because across the street, there's a building that's dolled up to look like the abortion clinic, but it's actually not an abortion clinic at all. It's run by a pro-life agency. And by the time you even work out where you are, they will have told you a whole bunch of false information about abortion. They may have told you you're going to hell. And by the time you stumble out of there, you'll have missed your appointment. Silent women don't ask for the laws they need and deserve. And indeed, this was actually how I came into the shame issue, because I am an abortion rights activist. And in order to change the laws, to try to get things out of the law that hurt women, to try to put things into the law that protect women, I actually need to raise awareness amongst decision makers and amongst the public that there is a problem. So if you think about any news item that you've ever seen or a newspaper article, about some broad social issue, you'll see that it starts with a story. It starts with a story of a particular person. And that's so that it doesn't seem so abstract and you can actually see that this broad social issue that's being spoken about is actually hurting someone. And that's why it is we need to make the effort to change things. But if I can't get women to tell their stories, I can't get things in the media. Or if I do get them in the media, I get them buried at the back of the news bulletin or the back of the paper where they have less influence. I couldn't even get women to come to Canberra and talk to politicians. And that means it's really hard for me to make some of the changes that I want to make. So you've got to ask yourself, if shame is so bad for women, then why is it still happening and who is doing it? Well, the answer to who's doing it is the shame stokers. And the reason is that shame is a gift that just keeps on giving. Shame equals silence equals ignorance equals shame equals silence equals more ignorance equals more shame and more silence and more ignorance. And that silence and that ignorance is the fertilizer for the ground on which repressive abortion laws and policies flourish. 
So I want to give you a bit of a feel for what shame stoking looks and sounds like. Because the weird thing is that women who've had abortions can hear it and it is around us all the time. But people who aren't tuned into it can't hear it. So it's really important that you see it, you hear it, and you recognize when it's about. Okay, so here's some examples. And I should say to you that I could have picked from thousands. So this is really just a tasting plate. A legacy of unutterable shame. That was said by an Australian health minister who said that Australia's abortion rate was a national tragedy that left a legacy of unutterable shame. Vaginally penetrated when they got pregnant. This was said very recently by an American legislator who was one of a number who's trying to change laws, and indeed some of these laws have been successfully implemented, that require a woman who is seeking abortion to have an ultrasound. But you see, most women who have abortions have them very early on in pregnancy, which means that kind of usual ultrasound doesn't work. You can't see anything. It's all just too small. So instead, they mandate that a probe be inserted inside that woman. This is a non-medically indicated transvaginal ultrasound. The woman's doctor is forced to give it to her even though there's no medical reason for it and she may have denied consent. And when it was pointed out to this legislator that in any other context you would call that rape, he essentially said, well, we don't really have to worry about those sort of women because after all, they were vaginally penetrated when they got pregnant. And our final shame stoking is abortion is a worse moral scandal than priests sexually abusing young people. This was said by a Catholic archbishop, again not long ago, to a group of young people. And I just want to stop for a minute on this one and just underscore what is really being said here. So what is being said is the moral evil that we need to concern ourselves about is not men in positions of authority and trust who rape children and or then cover it up. The real moral problem of our time is women who have abortions. So there's a couple of messages that the shame stokers are sending us there. One message is direct to women who've had abortions. So what they're worried about is if they talk about their abortion, they'll be shamed and judged and cast out. And the shame stokers are saying to them, you bet your life you will. You put your head above the parapet, Missy, and we will kick you in the teeth. And the second message the shame stokers are sending is to all of us. And it's really a lesson worth learning. And it is this, that if you don't tell your own story, other people will tell that story for you. Silence does not stay silent for long. So, this is an optimistic challenge, right? And I've just dragged you right down into the mud. But do not worry because we are heading up. And the reason we are heading up is because there is absolutely nothing that I have just told you that you cannot do something about. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Communities cause shame. And communities can stop it. So let's talk about what you can do. Reach out. Women who've had abortions who feel supported experience less shame and less of shame's noxious downstream consequences. So let the women in your world know that you are not a shame stoker. That if they talk to you about a problem pregnancy or an abortion, you will not judge them. You will not shame them, but you will listen with empathy and compassion and let them know they're not alone. You can dance. At the end of this month in Melbourne, women and men are going to get out onto the street wearing T-shirts like that 
and they're going to say exactly that. We are not shame stokers. They are going to say to women, we want to stand up for you and against abortion shame. And we are hoping, um, Reproductive Choice Australia is hoping, because we're organizing this event, we're desperately hoping it's going to catch on like wildfire. We want it to go right around the globe. We want communities everywhere to pick this sort of positive, uplifting message to send out to the women in their community that says the time for shame is over. And if you can't get to one of those flash mobs and or if you do go and you want to do something else, you can actually take precisely that pledge online. You can pledge that you will not engage in abortion shaming and you will not tolerate it when others do so. So please keep an eye out for that opportunity. So if you do all that, what do you get? So instead of this negative downward cycle, of shame equals silence equals ignorance, which causes more shame and more silence and more ignorance, you get an upward spiral. You get empathy equals connection equals empowerment equals empathy equals connection equals empowerment for women. So I'll, some of you may have seen this. I'll just give you like a quick chance to just run your eyes over it. I in no way mean to disrespect the person who said this, okay? He said he was one of the first people to speak out against the Nazis and he deserves heaps of respect. But I've put it up there because the truth is that I don't really like it. And I don't really like it because even though it's true, even though it is true that one of the reasons we act morally is because we're worried that if we don't stand up for people, women who have abortions say, that women who have abortions won't stand up for us. That is true. But I'm looking for something morally much bigger than that. I'm looking for something more Lady Diana, who in the midst of the AIDS crisis, when people were seeking to shun and stigmatize and judge and cast out anybody who was thought to have the virus and gay men, she started reaching out her hand to touch those people and to shake their hands. I'm looking for something more like the King of Denmark, who the apocryphal story goes when the Nazis came into Denmark and said, you have to brand all your Jews with a star. He said, well, fine. But if that's going to happen, I'm going to wear a star too, and so is every Dane. I'm looking for people who want to say, not by my hand, not on my watch, because I am the strong one. And standing up for women and against abortion shame, it is just the right thing to do. So, I had an abortion. Or maybe I didn't. But I hope by now you know that it doesn't matter either way. Because we won't be silent anymore. Thank you. <laughs>